Okay, okay. Uh, uh, thank you guys. Uh, I'm Jim from NTU. Today I'm so honored to uh, chair Professor uh, Jim's talk. Professor Song Jin received his bachelor degree from Peking University uh, in 1997 and a PhD degree in 2002 from Cornell University, and as well as postdoc research at Harvard University. Uh, Professor Jin, as, as you know, is a, is a versatile scientist. His interest in the chemistry, physics, and the technology, and the technology applications of non-scale and the solid materials. He has synthesized many kind of nanomaterials, okay? I will, I will not including everything, uh, but uh, including uh, the metal chocolate the silicide, halide perovskite. He also made great contributions to the growing mechanism of nanomaterials, such as the dislocation-driven growth of nanomaterials. I believe he will mention this in his talk. And apart from this, uh, Prof. Jin explored the applications of nanomaterials such as the electrocatalysis, solar cell, uh, optoelectronics, so on and so forth. And uh, yeah, in terms of the publication, Prof. Jin has published more than 200 papers on the co aid patent. He also recognized with the NNS Perry Award, a research corporation, Cultural Scholar Award, TR35 Award, SSX Mobile Solid State Chemistry Fellowship, and the Alfred P. Solon Research Fellowship, as well as the University of Wisconsin Madison Willis Associate Award, and the, the, the HI Romas Faculty Fellowship, and uh, the SS in Organic Nanoscience Award. So he is he serve, he's now serving as a senior editor uh, for SS Nano SS Energy Letters. So there's uh, so much things I would like to share with you, but yeah, let's, let's uh, uh, leave the stage to Professor Jin for his great talk. All right, thank you very much, uh, Jen, for that introduction. Thank you, Alice, for, uh, uh, for inviting me to come to this uh, stage. And uh, you know, it's a tremendous honor to uh, be able to speak to you here. Uh, let me make sure first the technology is working properly. So I think you are seeing my PowerPoint screen now, right? So now this is not the. A... Okay, so uh, are you seeing my presenter wheel? Or are you seeing my note wheel? Uh, you just uh, try to play model. Now it's okay. Okay, so uh, is the uh, slide up? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. So, uh, yes. Uh, 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 let me pick up where, where I was. Uh, so, it's also particularly an honor to share this stage with Professor Yan Li. Uh, as we alluded to uh, um, a moment ago, uh, I was a undergrad uh, at uh, Peking University. So, uh, so, it's actually a great honor to share the stage with, uh, you know, um, my professors. And also uh, that you know, uh, I think the training I got at Peking, you know, uh, you know, helped me tremendously in my scientific career. Uh, but you know, uh, of course, you know, uh, the, my learning at Cornell and uh, my postdoc training with uh, you know Charlie Lieber also helped me a lot uh, with getting me into the uh, nano science, right? So today, actually, I would uh, speak about a topic uh, that is uh, kind of like a long-running topic in my group uh, for many, many years. So. Uh, but there's some recent uh, exciting advances that I'd like to share with you uh, that uh, I put this in a very you know, interesting title called To Twist, uh, to Not To Twist, From School Dislocation Driven Growth to 2D Quantum Materials. Okay, so uh, you see how this goes. In fact, uh, I would say that uh, the, the, the last part of the talk have never been given. This is the first time I speak in public about this topic. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, we'll see how it goes, okay. So I understood that this is actually a fairly general audience uh, with potentially a lot of undergrads, a lot of uh, you know, scientists might be far away from what I do. So I decided to add a few uh, very general slides. Uh, in fact, these are basically what I would do in my uh, introduction to nanoscience class, you know, more or less with some modifications, right? So uh, uh, I want to kind of you know, make a broad case about nanoscience and uh, you know, why we're doing nanoscience and uh, you know, what uh, people like me, a chemist, are excited about uh, you know uh, in the nanoscience, right? Uh, so as you know, actually that you know uh, uh, the scale of matter, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, vary all the way from what we're familiar with in, in their uh, macroscopic world, you know, uh, ants and you know uh, objects you see on top, you know, millimeter, centimeter scale, all the way down to uh, the nano scale, uh, at the atomic scale, which is about angstrom or so. And then you have molecules, you have DNAs, you have proteins, you have on left hand side uh, the all of the natural, uh, you know, uh, materials or natural entities that are in different scales. On the right hand side are the material we make, uh, you know, uh, by human being, right? So, uh, and in fact, we just spoke about nanotubes in Professor uh, Yan Li's talk. And, uh, you know, we have all the uh, nano fabricated, you know, machineries, you know, MAMs and so on and so forth, right? Uh, so this is actually really a revolution that has been going on for the last, uh, you know, uh, uh, 30 years or so. Uh, but most people attribute this, uh, to the origin to uh, this uh, visionary speech by, uh, late Professor Richard Feynman uh, contact. There's plenty of, of room at the bottom. Uh, so this is actually a fascinating speech, particularly if you think about the fact that this was given in 1959. And in fact, you can find a copy of speech in uh, this website. And I just copy a few bullet points here just to uh, you know, give you a flavor. So basically he made the point uh, at that time that if you think about the physics and chemistry, there's no reason why we could not manipulate uh, atoms and matters at the uh, small scale, at the atomic scale, to the point that we can really control everything atom by atom, right? So I, by now, this is actually fairly you know, obvious to us, but if you think about 1959, this is actually before a lot of the modern technology are available, uh, that is actually truly re revolutionary, right? So the general point I want to derive from showing this speech is actually that for me as a chemist, the ability to rationally and precisely control the size, dimension, and morphology of nanostructures will allow us to control the structures and quantum state, electronic structures and quantum states of matter, uh, you know, uh, in a very rational way. And then with that kind of control, we will have the ability to discover new physical properties and thus eventually enable applications in electronics, photonics, energy, biotech, and whatnot. Right. So this is actually basically why we're here. Right. In fact, you know, uh, we didn't get to this part in the panel discussion. I, I did say that, uh, you know, in fact, nano is with us uh, the whole time, right? Uh, in fact, without nano, in my opinion, without nano, I will not be speaking to you in this virtual format this way. You know, the computers we're using, the internet we're using, were enabled by the modern microelectronics. As you know, that actually was enabled by, uh, you know, uh, amazing engineering called, you know, fabrication, nano fabrication, right? So basically we start out with single crystalline uh, wafers. We actually go, you know, uh, you know use a variety of so-called lithography and, uh, you know, a variety of tools to make these, uh, you know, IC chips, chips that have a lot of transistors. That they're so small that you have to use an electron microscope to see what's the structure in it. It's in fact, three dimensional and very intricate. Uh, and this actually was invent, uh, invented uh, based on the uh, transistors actually that people made in the 1940s uh, and then combined with ideas in the 1960s where uh, people actually realized you can integrate this individual transistor into integrated circuit. By the way, these are Nobel Prize you know, in uh, you know, different times you can see here. And so over the last few decades, uh, you know, people follow this so-called Moore's law to shrink these devices you know, smaller and smaller in fact, today, you know, uh, uh, the, the computers that we're buying from, uh, you know, uh, Intel or whatnot, I mean, the computer chips we're buying from Intel have the cross-sectional size, uh, the, the so-called gate line size of five nanometer. That is actually nanotechnology. And that to me is the big, biggest practitioner of nanotechnology. This is actually a truly, truly amazing technology. If you think about it, the computer CPU you buy today uh, will have more than 10 billion transistors in one chip. That's more than the number of human beings on this planet in one small chip, probably smaller than the size of your thumb, thumb, thumbnail, right? So that's actually a really amazing uh, in the new achievement, okay? And that's actually really driven by the need to produce cheaper and more powerful computers using primarily engineering methods, right? So, so that I think is the technology underpinning of what we're talking about here, right? So of course, you know, uh, in my mind, also the revolutionary uh, nanotechnology were also enabled by new technology that allow us to see and under understand things at the atomic scale. I think most notable will be uh, the uh, invention of scanning tunneling microscopy uh, in 1981 by uh, Rohr and Binging, uh, who actually shared a Nobel Prize in a few years later. So with uh, scanning tunneling microscopy, we can visualize individual atoms. We actually can uh, push them around and construct things, you know, at the uh, 
you know, uh, very precise atomic scale, even though these are very tedious and low throughput, but they really, it's not gonna be an industrial technology, but it really allow us to think about, you know, uh, atoms uh, as atoms, think about nano at the atomic level, right? And of course, the other techniques like AFM, and SEM, and so on so forth, uh, all the electron microscopy tools that have been with us for many years, uh, continually improve that actually really popularize and make everything possible. I will also make a general point actually that not only nano was with us uh, in the last few decades in the uh, electronics. In fact, we have seen nano uh, you know, uh, over many years too, right? Sometimes we didn't know about it. So uh, many of you might have uh, you know, uh, like, you know, seeing these beautiful stained glasses in the church windows, or oh, this actually famous so-called ruby cup, uh, which is actually uh, made out of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, basically nano-sized gold nanoparticles uh, made through many years of trial and error by the glass makers. And in the modern times, that will be the topic of plasmonics of noble metal, you know, nanostructures, right? So basically the color of these uh, objects were coming from the plasmonic, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, of these materials. Uh, so now we understand how this works and we can control them really well. But uh, this was actually always uh, been practiced, you know, through, uh, you know, uh, experience actually over uh, millennium, right? Uh, so in the modern times, as a chemist, obviously we now are able to practice that science. We learn how to actually make structures really small. And here's one celebrated, man, uh, you know, uh, image of the, quantum dots, semiconductor quantum dots, and uh, very small nano scale semiconductors that even have, uh, even at the bulk that have the same property, there's the same light emission. You know, when you make them smaller and smaller, the light emission can be turned into a rainbow color, which is really kind of like a poster child of the uh, nano science, right? And of course, you know, it will be amiss to not talk about, you know, the uh, uh, carbon nano science, which, you know, uh, Professor Yan Li spoke about, you know, uh, so uh, we can have, uh, you know, buckyballs, you know, uh, you know, a small molecular level nanoscale object of uh, made out of complete carbon by wrapping a sheet of carbon into spheres. And then you can wrap them in different ways to make nanotubes, which is really, uh, you know, uh, what Professor Yan uh, explained beautifully in her talk a moment ago. Of course, if you texture the fragments of the out, that's actually graphene and the graphene nano ribbons, which are still, you know, uh, you know uh, all the rage going on in the research going on right now, right? Of course, if you move out further to the, uh, you know, inorganic nanostructures where you actually can make, uh, you know, uh, uh, many different uh, semiconductors and other inorganic compounds into nanoscale one dimensional object called nanowars and nanotubes, then you can use them for many different things, you know, uh, and actually, in fact, I will speak a lot about the synthesis of this in a second. So I will skip this uh, right now, but I'll just showcase a lot of people have, uh, you know, turned this into, uh, you know, very, uh, you know, uh, uh, exciting, uh, you know, technology platforms. You know, Professor Pei Dong Yang from Berkeley, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, show that we can use nanowire for lasers, and we can actually use electrical uh, pump-driven lasers. You know, by Charles Lieber sensors. You can build nanowires uh, for uh, uh, solar cells. You can actually use them to enhance the, uh, you know, uh, solar energy conversion and many other applications such as thermoelectrics, you know, uh, spintronics and so on first, right? So, uh, so today, actually, I'm not here to talk about these applications. Actually, we are engaged with some of them, uh, but I will actually primarily speak about, you know, what actually we actually learn in making them, how do we control them and make them in a very rational and elaborate way, right? But before I do that, I'd like to actually maybe show a couple other things as, you know, uh, Alice uh, was alluding to, uh, we do not just work on this synthesis off topic. So I will just showcase a couple other things that we do uh, that, you know, uh, just give you a flavor so that, you know, uh, if you're interested in other aspect of research, feel free to check out our website, right? So, so my group are, uh, are interested in the energy problems. Actually, uh, the uh, broad, uh, you know, motivation for our uh, research in energy problem uh, is motivated by the challenge of intermediacy of renewable energy. So uh, in my mind, uh, renewable energy is here to stay. You know, it's just a matter of how quickly they will propagate and uh, get deployed. You know, solar uh, is, uh, you know, increasing very quickly. Uh, wind is getting popular everywhere. But a lot of these have a problem, which is actually that these are not constant, they're intermittent. Sun goes down every day, wind blows and stops. Uh, and also a lot of these energy are quite diffuse. So how do we utilize this energy in an effective and efficient way? Depends on our ability to not only harvest that energy, but also store them in a massive scale in an effective manner, 
right? There are many different approaches to do that. And uh, you know, two of the things that we're working on here, I'll just give a brief shout out. One of them is to use electrochemistry to do electrocatalysis or photoelectrochemistry to do solar to fuel conversion. For example, we've done research uh, that showing that you can use, uh, you know, uh, uh, designed a nanoscale uh, catalyst like, you know, COPS to actually efficiently convert a uh, uh, proton into hydrogen, which will be a clean fuel you can use. And you actually do that through sunlight to, uh, uh, to, to the field, right? In fact, you know, some of the catalysts we reported were actually uh, pretty efficient and actually very, uh, very, uh, 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 very, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, and actually cutting edge actually when it was published, right? We also are working on other chemical conversions such as uh, OER, oxygen evolution reaction, and actually also recently uh, oxygen reduction reaction. So, uh, and this is actually, uh, you know, particularly the two electron one that produce H2O2, which is a very useful chemical that are used to be made in a chemical way that could be quite energy intensive. Right, so there's some ongoing research going on here that was just published if you're interested in checking them out, right? So that's actually one type of uh, solar energy research, uh, energy research. So the other type of research that is relatively new is actually that we're also working on this type of uh, energy device called integrated solar fall batteries, where the aim is to actually harvest the sunlight directly and store them as uh, redox chemicals and put them in a tank as a flow battery, which is uh, liquid batteries. And in fact, recently, uh, just a couple of months ago, we actually published the record, uh, you know, solar full battery device with 20% efficiency round trip, meaning sunlight to uh, the harvest, to the storage, and then re-deliver back out as electricity. That whole thing is actually 20%, right? So that's actually quite exciting. And uh, we'll continue to work on that. Okay, so, uh, and also we have a small project in collaboration with other people working on uh, using nano for a uh, biotech. And so what we call this nanopolemics. So uh, the idea here is to use functionalized nanoparticles to uh, you know, uh, capture and enrich very rare uh, proteins uh, in blood, in tissues, to allow us to do better analysis of proteins called podomics analysis. So uh, you know, I'll just highlight most recently, we uh, published a paper where we use this to capture a type of hard biomarker that is called cardiac tribonin. You know, so uh, a, a, a capturing them out, um, analyzing them in detail, will allow you to hopefully in the future diagnose and uh, you know predict heart diseases in a much more accurate way than what people are doing now. Right. So that's actually something that we're very excited about. So uh, in fact, the, uh, my collaborator, Professor Ying Ji, is also a Peking U alumni, and I will confess she's actually my wife. Right. So uh, this is a perfect marriage in nanotechnology and uh, mass spectrometry and photomics. Okay. So with that, I, I'll actually now come back to the main topic. So uh, I think I'm doing on time. Uh, so as I said, the main topic is how do you actually think about growing the materials, right? So the first part is really uh, is a, you know uh, uh, how do you use a new type of defects called screw dislocation to drive the uh, nanomaterials growth, right? So uh, I think you know to understand that I want to back out a little bit to say if you're going to grow nanomaterials in a small dimension, you know in a, you know, one-dimensional or two-dimensional way, you need to think about the kinetics of crystal growth because in some sense, you are really manipulating that kinetics to allow you to grow not into a bulk, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, polyhedron crystal, all, you know, thin film, but rather to differentiate and control that into 1D and 2D object. And to understand that, you have to go back and understand the fundamentals of crystal growth that go back to uh, many, many decades. So, uh, so uh, since once people understood the atomic structure of solids very quickly, you know, uh, people realize that you can imagine the crystal growth happening through the so-called layer by layer growth, where you basically use, you know, uh, treat each of these atom as a little box here that you actually attach to a little step edge. And then you actually, uh, you know, uh, basically like laying bricks uh, on a wall, you actually basically, you know, keep going and actually make each of this layer. Right? It turns out that this process actually need a high supersaturation because the supersaturation is defined as the concentration that is above the equilibrium concentration for a solubility uh, of a solid. And the reason for that is because it takes some energy to nucleate that initial step. To get that step going, you need to have some you know, additional concentration to overcome that energy barrier to actually get that going. So layer by layer growth has a slight problem in terms of the growth because of, of that. Right, so, and this problem was solved in the late 1940s by Sir F.C. Frank, uh, who actually recognized actually that a lot of materials have crystalline defects called screw dislocation. 
So, uh, and uh, I'll actually now give a quick primer about school detergent. So these are, you know, basically defects in the three-dimensional solids. Oh, uh, you can imagine them in two ways. There are actually two types of school detergent. Edge detergent is basically an extra plane inserted to a, uh, a solid. It's like, you know, having an extra page in the, the side of your book. A school detergent is like taking a solid and shear open a little bit to create a little stack, right? So that's the two primary type of school detergents. You can have mixed detergents uh, like that. And, and you can define a uh, important parameter called Burgers factor, which define how big is that school detergent. And you can actually define that by walking a third curve you know, in that. If you're a material scientist uh, as a undergrad uh, twin, uh, you know, uh, student, you probably have learned this in your you know, second year class already. Right. So with school detergent, in fact, actually Frank has a very interesting thing. Crystals are like people. It's only the defect that makes them interesting. And so what makes them interesting is actually that if you have uh, that school detergent, you will have a little step here. So basically that solved the problem of having to nucleate the step for the layer by layer growth. You will just attach atom to that step. And then the interesting part is actually that you will keep uh, winding this step and make a so-called self-perpetuating step. So once you have that step out of the school division, you will run, never run out of that step. So you now actually will actually have a low super saturation to grow your crystal, which is actually shown in this graph here. This is a typical growth chart for you know, dissolution driven growth, where at low super saturation growth, dissolution growth happens, then you go by layer by layer growth, and then you actually go to dendritic growth, which is actually the regime where you see snowflakes and so on and so forth. Right, and so so this is actually mostly understood in the early fifties, and actually uh, summarized in this uh, you know uh, uh, amazing uh, you know uh, uh, reveal that you know uh, paper that's fifty page long. Uh, I think it's a classic that everyone who is interested in materials and crystal growth will read. And we actually re retell the story in the nano uh, science actually in this uh, perspective. You know, reveal uh, a few years ago. Right. So now I'll come back to nano works. Okay. So uh, uh, when we actually started to work on nanowars, as I told you, I was a postdoc with Charles Lieber, and nanowars was already very popular in the field. And the most common way people use to make nanowars is using the so-called vapor liquid solid growth, where you know, uh, if uh, you have the case of a silicon nanowar, you have a gold nanoparticles, actually will melt uh, when you heat them up, uh, and a uh, particular one mix up with gold in this eutectic binary phase diagram. And then you will dissolve the silicon in that gold silicon mount, and then eventually silicon will become super saturated and crash out and grow on the side of the particle and grow into a one dimensional nanowire. And that is called vapor liquid solid growth because you have a vapor phase of precursor, solid phase of the nanowire, and liquid phase of the particle. Right. So basically, you end up with structures like this beautiful, well defined nanowires with usually a catalyst cap at the end. Right. From a, uh, a, 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 a crystal growth point of view, though, uh, the vapor liquid solid growth, in fact, is in some sense, actually, uh, the video looks like cut and play. Uh, yeah, OK, it's OK. Uh, it's OK. Yeah, video cut and play, it's OK. So in, in, uh, you can see the pictures on the right. And the uh, vapor liquid solid growth, what happens after that, you're doing the layer by layer growth. Uh, you know, uh, 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 at an interface of the catalyst particle with uh, your, uh, you know, uh, uh, nanowires, and then you're uh, uh, sweeping that layers uh, one by one. But the rate along the interface here, and the rate on the sidewall are very different. That's how you differentiate them, right? So we actually learned this. Actually, we actually learned the disintegrating growth first through going this hyperbranched. Uh, nanowires of light sulfide, light solenite, actually for solar energy applications, which doesn't matter at this stage now, we saw these really beautiful, fascinating hyperbranch structures. You see, these are really, really nice, intricate three-dimensional structures with a lot of branches. Uh, but if you really look at it carefully, these are still driven by the vapor liquid solid growth, where the in situ generated light catalyst is actually the particle that give you this uh, branching structure. And why they're you know, going these irregular structures of three dimensional you know, perpendicular to each other is because of the epitaxial match, the crystallographic orientation between the different uh, part of the materials. Right? But besides these structures, while we're growing this, accidentally, sometimes we'll see really fascinating tree like structures that you see in this picture. Right, so these are uh, beautiful tree structures of a few hundred microns long, 
and they are like a cone shape with uh, you know uh, four different branches, and they're actually in fact perpendicular each other. You can see at the bottom here, you see the uh, hyper branched you know uh, uh, clusters I just showed a moment ago. Sometimes they grow off those branches, and uh, they have this uh, you know a beautiful rotation of the branches as they go along as well, which is really fascinating. Very beautiful structure, you know, mathematically proven. You can actually show these are really nice you know, curves and so on and so forth, right? So what we learned out of this structure was in fact you know. Uh, uh, that what we have here is a special case of a school distribution during growth, where now you fit a little distribution spiral in the middle of a uh, cylinder, which is a nanowire. And when you have that spiral on top, you actually can now use uh, the different uh, growth conditions between the layer by layer growth and distribution growth, differentiate that growth. So it's actually a lot harder to grow on the uh, sidewall, uh, but it's a lot easier to grow on top. So by doing so, you're able to break the symmetry of crystal growth to achieve one-dimensional anisotropic growth, right? So that's basically the essence of uh, what you are doing there, right? But now the bunches you see there, in fact, was still driven by the traditional catalyst-driven growth uh, with, again, in situ generated lead particles. Uh, and, and those actually grow off the side as a epitaxial branch. So again, remember, these are cubic, uh, you know, uh, lead sulfide rocks, rock salt structures with all of the you know, uh, 90 degree angles, you know, between the uh, different uh, parts. So, uh, so basically the tree structure here is a very, very interesting combination of the distribution driven growth of the trunk and the uh, VLS vapor liquid solid growth of the branch. And the rate of the two growths are different. So you see a, a cone shape, right? In fact, to imagine that, you know, a, a nanowire with a distribution in the middle, here I have an object actually, uh, you know, in fact, most of you have, uh, experience something like this if you have where ever walk through a staircase. But this object is really, really uh, spectacular. It's actually a pair, pair of skyscrapers, uh, uh, you know, uh, in Chicago, downtown Chicago, called Mariana City. Oh, uh, uh, actually, the uh, nickname is called Kong Cop Towers. Basically, the whole thing is a ramp. Uh, the apartments are actually on a gentle slope. Actually, the lower half is really just a parking garage. You can see the cars actually pointing out actually from them, right? So imagine if you are person walking the, this building, uh, going through this ramp, is really the way you imagine the atom uh, walks through this atom in this area, in, in this nanowire, through this uh, dissipated nanowires. Okay? So uh, hopefully that uh, become a little more visual, right? So uh, we actually did hard work to prove this is the case, actually primarily through using a TEM, actually called diffraction contrast TEM. You are able to uh, visualize, you see this uh, dark line in the middle of uh, the nanowire. And that's actually your school dislocation. In fact, you can do a uh, type of uh, analysis called, you know, invisibility analysis by, you know, tilting to the particular zones. You can actually uh, choose to not see this, uh, you know, uh, contrast. Actually, you can take then those two directions and do a cross product. You can get the Burgers spectra uh, of the uh, dissuasion, which is, I mean, in this case, in the mixed dissuasion between the two different directions, right? So I think we did all of the hard work just to tell you that we did that, right? So now there's a question of then why are these branches rotating? Of course, you are not seeing them rotating because they're very small here, very sparse right now, but remember all of these beautiful rotating structures. So why are they rotating? So here I'm showing a few objects that are, are you know, twisting. So uh, in fact, twisting is a very common thing you see in our, our macroscopy work. Actually, I collected a few uh, beautiful buildings. Actually, I'm lucky to see two of them already. I have yet to see the twisting tower in Sweden. And, uh, you know, uh, well, of course, we can twist them when we build architecture by designing each layers to be different and actually build a frame step by step. But how does Adam make themselves twist and actually make that beautiful twisting structure? Right. It turns out that was actually due to the school dislocation. So when you have a school dissolution uh, in the context of a solid mechanics, it is basically a shear open of the solid cylinder, creating a little step. And that shear, you see here on this one, create lattice strain, uh, you know, and stress within the crystal lattice. And the way material responds to that strain and stress is actually by twisting its crystal lattice to counter that strain and stress. And that actually is, uh, you know, uh, mathematically uh, solved and proven by J.D. Ashby in 1953. And, uh, you know, he derived a very simple formula, you know, uh, shown here, uh, the twist, uh, you know, uh, of the lattice is, uh, you know, proportional to the Burger spectral magnitude and uh, inversely proportional to pi r square, which is a cross-sectional area of your cylinder. 
right? So, uh, so in fact, this is a phenomenal concept in material science. People usually learn it in the chapter two or three of uh, mechanics of you know material properties and so on and so forth. But in a typical context of uh, of the material sciences, this, this is a conceptual design, you know, you are not able to visualize it because the typical bulk material, the R the, uh, is very large. So the twist is very subtle, and very, you know, uh, uh, you know, hard to see, right? But the structure we have here is a nanoscale structure with a very small cross-national, uh, you know, uh, uh, area, a very small diameter. So the twist is actually quite uh, dramatic. You can get 180 degree twist in 10 micron or so, as you see in the nano here, here right? In fact, in, in the original paper, we did a survey of, uh, of this uh, twist by counting a lot of trees. Actually, we can actually use that to fit the Burgess vector and actually compare that to the lattice constant. Every, everything actually clicks, actually make a lot of sense, right? So now, now this is the first time I explained to you a twist. And remember the key word here is actually twist, a lattice twist caused by school dislocation. Okay, so now that's the first initial discovery. So, uh, so after that, we keep looking and try to find other uh, dissolutions in different objects. So we actually grew a very popular material called zinc oxide uh, out of aqueous solution. In fact, zinc oxide paper is probably one of the most prolific papers out there in nano uh, science literature. And uh, we actually uh, look very carefully in the very thin nanoworks. We in fact see very nice clean dissolution contrast, just like what you see in the last paper. But more interestingly, when you actually go look at some other part of the nanostructures, you will see hollow tubes. You see a cavity in them, or actually sometimes bubbles in them. So they are not continuous. If you look at that hollow tube, that is still a single crystal. Everything is still continuous. The only thing is actually that the middle part is missing. So why would they become hollow? And in fact, that also is caused by school dissolution. And that is actually because just like in the HB twist case, you create strain and stress. Uh, you know, uh, you can actually further define an energy term based on that string and stress, which is actually shown in this equation. Uh, and the uh, string energy in a dissolution is uh, proportional to the Burgess vector square and proportional to the surface, you know, tension of the materials and actually related to the dimension of the materials, right? So, uh, in fact, uh, even as early in the early 50s, uh, FC Frank recognized actually that when the Burgess vector get too big, the string energy term will get so severe that uh, the material is not happy with so much string. So move the material around the core of this region to take out those you know, uh, materials that are shrink the hardest. But then by doing so, you create a surface energy due to that internal surface. You balance the two terms. Then you actually predict what could be the diameter of those hollow tubes. And those hollow tubes are called open core dissociations or dissolution micropipes or digital nanopipes in our case, right? So in fact, this is a common phenomenon in material science. A lot of material like silicon carbide gallon nitride, if you do not grow the vapors, do not grow the single flow very carefully, you will have a hollow core in the middle. And that actually is, can be a few microns large, right? So this is actually a big problem for those material for many years until people know how to suppress that to give them the application you'll see today, you know, in the power electronics. Because if you have all these holes, that device will be defective, right? So basically, Come back to the nanotubes. Nanotubes are nothing but nanoware with a dissolution micropipes. They are the equilibrium preferred, you know, uh, you know, uh, configuration due to the energy conservation. They want to minimize the total energy, so you have to make them hollow to make them structured, right? So this is actually the model for that, you know, uh, dissolution uh, nanotube. And in fact, again, there's a beautiful architecture out there. Uh, if you have ever visited uh, Guggenheim Museum in New York. That is a perfect novel of this really nanotube. It's a bit uh, squashy though, it's not too tall, but you will see outside is a spiral. You go inside, it's actually an open core in the center. The galleries are all on the spiral ramp, right? So really beautiful, nice buildings. I love that museum. I always uh, like to go back to visit again when I go to New York City, right? So now, so that's a uh, tube, I explained to that, okay? But here is a little problem, turns out. When we actually look at these uh, uh, nanotubes, uh, these uh, zinc outside nanotubes we found, when we look at them and examine, try to find the HB twist. Remember I told you there should be a lattice twist in them. We could not find them. The twist is very gentle, okay? We could not easily find them, okay? It actually it turns out uh, you can you know, do the same thing you did before, but uh, we actually later on develop a, a more sophisticated analysis called twist control analysis, which I won't go into detail here. You can read that paper if you're interested in doing that. And we found twists on the order of a degree per micron, two degree per micron, uh, for very thin nanowars, thinner than the uh, you know, less alpha nanowars we saw before. 
So why is that the case? Why is that not twisting anymore? Okay, it turns out the reason why they're not twisting anymore is because you have a hollow tube. When you have a hollow tube, you actually change the energy equation. You have to re-examine the energy equation because remember I told you having that hollow tube is a way to relieve the energy. So we can recalculate the total energy with a surface energy term, two pi, uh, you know, uh, surface uh, tension r, and, uh, you know, uh, and the uh, the original HV term, and also there's a term related to the relief of that, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, energy due to having that open core. When you do that and actually uh, do a global minimization of energy uh, with a diameter, you actually have this kind of uh, three-dimensional curve there. The value you see here at the C curve here is going to be the predicted uh, configuration, right? If you actually plot that in a different way, you can see you basically uh, have, uh, you know, break down this energy term into two parts. One basically is a part that, that you relieve by having twist. The other part is actually relief, uh, the blue part is actually re relieve that energy by having tubes, having hollow tubes. So you can see this curve, you can see right away that when you just make something hollow, then immediately the energy are dumped in making to hollow. You do not have to have a lot of twist. Only become, it become really, really hollow. The wall become really thin. You actually begin to see some twist, right? So basically this is actually the prediction. So the purple arrow here is basically corresponding to the situation we have here. That actually show you that actually the twist will be very, very little for a uh, hollow tube. In, in this case, with a fairly small diameter, that's a relatively thick wall for this tube. Right. So, uh, so basically, you know, this is actually a prediction, right? If you make something hollow, when they're not too thin, in, then they aren't going to twist too much. When they're getting thinner and thinner in the wall, they actually can twist quite a bit. And that's actually intuitive to our, you know, uh, uh, our, uh, you know, uh, understanding as well. You can twist our garden holes with a very thin wall, but it's not going to be easy to twist something, you know, with a solid rock. Right, so that's actually, uh, I think, also uh, quite reasonable to think about. Right, so now if you go and look at the literature, so this is actually mostly literature I collected before our paper were published. There are many, many nanotubes uh, reported out there in the literature, and in fact, uh, most of them didn't realize why they make them tu uh, tubes. The tubes are happening because these are the equilibrium configurations of the structures when they have the proper school dislocation, and you all can also see that most of them do not show a parent twist. But look at this one on the lower right hand side. This one actually can you can already see a very clear and nice twist on the side wall, you know, shown by the faceting here. And well, this one happened because the wall is very thin, right? So that actually perfectly fit our models. Okay, so to twist, so not to twist in nanotube, the question depends on what is the diameter of the inner tube. Okay, so now here I'm going to actually bring uh, a connection with what Professor Yan Li's talk. In fact. I'm very glad I didn't ask her beforehand. She actually showed the same paper in the middle of our talk, right? So uh, to me, there is a connection between what I talk about here and carbon nanotubes. We could view carbon nanotubes as the dream version of the seam wall nanotubes, where the wall is basically single atom thick, one carbon atom thick, right? So in this context, the chiral angle in the carbon nanotube is simply the HP twist in you know, uh, nanotubes uh, in our uh, language. And in fact, in this paper published by Professor Boris Jakobsen, they actually argued and um, you know, uh, calculated actually that uh, that dissolution Burgess factor can predict what is the kinetic probability of forming different type of nanotubes. Why some are faster to grow, grow faster, some grow slower, and that actually explains the eventual population, the one that cannot be faster, you can find them more often in the structure, in the final products, right? The one that are not, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, fast, then you will see fewer of them because they actually grow slower, right? In fact, this actually also give you potentially some idea how uh, you might actually use this to control the quality of a nanotube as well. And that's something I always ask my student to try and no one have dared to take that challenge yet. So, uh, but I think the fundamental challenge is actually eventually you have to control the quality of the seed. And, and that is very hard. And that's still something we're very fascinated about and interested in as well, right? So, uh, so uh, the quality control is a very interesting issue in uh, science, in particular to chemists. And that's actually something that we're continuing to be interested in, right? So I think that's uh, uh, nanotube. So now I'll just show one thing. In fact, I'll be embarrassed to tell you that this is something we have looked at for 12 years and we still haven't completely figured out, we still haven't published. So beyond making uh, hollow tubes, we can make hollow tubes into helix. 
And now these are, again, fascinating object from geometry. Uh, you know, to define a helix, you need to have curvature, portion, and twist. And helix are everywhere. Here, I took a picture of a garden plant in my own garden. You know, right? So how did nature make it? How do we make it? And, you know, in fact, the fascinating thing about this helix is actually the whole thing is single crystal. So the, the below here is a very elaborate experiment called actuary macro diffraction, coherent actuary macro diffraction. They show the whole thing is a single crystal. Our orientation is actually very consistent, actually very, very little twist, about 0.5 degree twist throughout the whole structure, right? So how do you explain all of this? Uh, that's still something we actually haven't been able to do in the you know, last 12 years. So we <laughs> are still sitting on it, right? So now with all of those understanding, uh, you know, also in the last 10 years or so, we have developed the rational design of how do you grow nanomaterials by dislocation. And, and that go back to the fundamental chart I showed earlier, where I told you that dissolution during growth is small preferred at low super surgery conditions, layer by layer growth, and then dendritic really growth take over, uh, you actually go up. So the key to do this one during growth really well is to control that growth condition very carefully. And, uh, and that's one of the key tricks we play is to do flow reaction. And of course, flow reaction is common in CVD in chemical vapor deposition, but it's actually much more uncommon in solution growth, right? Because most of the solution nanomaterial growth, you put a pot, you put, you heat them up and you get what you get, right? But in those situations, the superposition condition can vary a lot, which is actually not ideal, actually will allow you, it will actually lead to a diversity of, of the morphology that we often see, right? So basically in this paper, we demonstrated actually that by changing the superposition, we can increasingly tune the aspect ratio and tune the growth condition of this material. So we actually achieve much better control, right? So basically this kind of understanding basically tells you that to grow something by dissolution is pretty easy you have to just pay attention to two things. One, you need to have some source of dislocations. The reality is that they're everywhere. Uh, you know, it's very hard to not have dislocation. It's a matter of life. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, it's just a matter of uh, how frequently you find them. The second thing is you have to create the right condition for that growth mode to dominate, actually to, to, uh, to flourish, so to all compete under a growth mode. Right, so basically, you no, know, there's a period actually we expand to many other solution growths, you know, iron oxide, you know, uh, copper, copper oxide, and many different materials. I won't go into that detail here now, and just to tell you that you can read the reviews and the other papers we publish. Right. In fact, also here I will actually bring a, a, a little shout out to a, a other uh, ongoing project in my group that are somewhat related to what the topic here was about, which is actually that our group are really uh, very interested and uh, have uh, done a lot of interesting work on uh, learn using this fundamental understanding of crystal growth to grow halide perovskite into nanostructures, right? So uh, halide perovskites, as you might know, is the super hot solar material right now. They're very interesting for photonics as well. And we learn how to grow them by solution using the understanding we gain through the dissolution growth. In fact, some of the early structure we see even have a hollow tubes, which, you know, again, related to what I said, could be a hallmark of the dissolution growth, right? And these actually are really good uh, lasing cavities. So uh, we have published, you know, this laser paper that is really, you know, taking off uh, in the community. And we're now actually working on 2D plus guides and hydrostructures and so on and so forth as well, right? So today I won't go into this because this is actually that were, that were, you know, digressing into a different direction and to come back and then come back to the, the graceful growth itself. So here I will do a little summary just to say that, you know, uh, basically uh, by now we understood, I think I explained how to grow nanowires and nanotubes and actually, and these understandings are really universal, right? It doesn't depend on one material, light sulfide, zinc oxide, perovskite, it doesn't matter. If you can grow them by crystal growth, potentially we can control them, right? So now I'm actually started to migrate into 2D materials and layer materials, okay? In fact, the first thing we did in this is in fact, uh, done uh, through this layer uh, oxide hydroxide materials called, uh, you know, uh, you know, zinc uh, hydroxy sulfate. The detail in fact doesn't matter too much, to be honest. Uh, we quickly grew them into, and then we realized actually that they have this rainbow pattern. Uh, and, and this is happening because of thickness variation. So these are really squash pyramid with a lot of sparrow in it. We actually examine that sparrow, we realize that the 2D place you see there can be grown by dislocation. So uh, when the uh, steps of the dissolution propagate equally at uh, the same rate inside and outside, everything will propagate. You will just make a very squash pyramid. 
If they catch up with the outside step, then you eventually will turn into nanowires and nanotubes. So in some sense, the 2D plates are actually more intuitive in the nanowires in that sense, right? In fact, you can control that slope by controlling the super saturation due to the dif differential growth rate and so on and so forth, right? So we show that with this uh, CHS material and we also see that they happen in hydroxide. In fact, it happened even in gold. And, and, and uh, we actually also did this interesting analysis the strain in this material called twist. Uh, this is what we call the spider contours. But also I want to emphasize actually, that at the same time, a lot of people out there in the community are discovering similar spirals in the more common 2D material like molysulfide, tungsten selenide. And I, hey, I give you some examples here, you know, that uh, I will actually go back to that a little bit more in a second, right? So now just to further elaborate, just like in the nanowire cases, you can control that really well. So in this case, we control a type of metal hydroxide called layer double hydroxide LDH by manipulating the growth condition to make sure we grow well-defined clean plates. And, and then you can see the nice spirals and the twist contours. If you do not control them very well, you are gonna grow flower morphologies and really messy plate structures, uh, which are all related to what we're seeing here. So to me, the structures you see on the right-hand side, the nanoflower of the 2D materials is to some degree, the CRISPR tree of the single nanowire you see in the one-dimensional literature. Right? These are three-dimensional interconnected dissociated plates that actually we're seeing here. Right? So that's the way I see it. Right? So now, now with that, I'm gonna formally go into the second segment. Actually, I'm really doing poor on time, so I need to actually speed up a little bit, is uh, to explain that having dissociation will have a tremendous impact on 2D materials with dissociation and so on and so forth. Okay, so I think this is actually the topic that our host, uh, Zheng Liu, is actually more of an expert on. So I'll just, uh, since I uh, didn't introduce at the beginning, I'll just give a quick, you know, shout out. So uh, graphene and uh, molybdenum sulfide and boron nitride and all of these 2D materials have flourished in the last, uh, you know, 20 years or so. And people are interested in them as a building block for hydrochargers, for, uh, you know, variety of physics like electronics and, uh, you know, very nice optical electronic properties. So these are really, really uh, quite uh, interesting materials, but particularly with molybdenum sulfide, they're actually in fact more complex. The reason why they are more complex is such that there's an intrinsic asymmetry in these uh, layers. And also depending on how you stack them, uh, these layers, you can actually stack them in a so-called 2H configuration where the layers are stacked a little bit. You can do it in the one three R configuration where they stack a little bit further, A, B, C, so I can come back to the A's called three R because it's three layers. And then if you have a different crystal fraction layer, you might have a one you know, layer repeat called 1D, right? So all of these are happening in the natural uh, you know, systems of the materials. And, and these stacking have a tremendous impact to their physical properties and to their applications, right? So I'll just give you one example that is uh, we actually did uh, that to show 2H to 1T transition of the molysulfide uh, flakes actually in fact make a tremendous uh, change in their catalytic property for catalyzing the proton to hydrogen generation, right? So this is actually a, a classic paper in the electrical catalysis now, you know, published uh, seven years ago where we show, you know, uh, by turning the phase of this material, you get a very big change in the property you know, and so on. So first, right, there are a lot of related to this going on that I won't go into, which is more like the energy topics, I'll come back to the, uh, the, the, the stacking uh, idea. So we actually been growing these uh, uh, layer materials uh, by CBD, chemical vapor division for many years. We always saw, uh, you know, uh, sparrows and, uh, you know, uh, the sparrows are just like the other sparrows I reported. So, uh, but then there's one extra thing that is really bizarre about it. You can see in this picture, you see three circles with different type of sparrows, triangular sparrows, and high signal spirals on the right, and then the green one shows a somewhere in between. Right? When you zoom into them, they all have spirals, and, and the, 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 the triangular one's easy to understand. The, the, the high signal one took us, this last two took us a while to understand. So after stirring this for about a year, we understood, in fact, these are actually composite dissociation spirals with two things winding together. Right? So we see the solid line and dashed line are actually spirals and they actually come out with a 50 de a 60 degree when they come out. In fact, when you can survey the AFM, you can see the step size and so on, so forth, they're changing. Right? So now we further did additional analysis on these spirals. We realized actually that the low frequency Raman and the high frequency Raman signature are all different for these different spirals. In fact, these Raman signatures tell you something about the stacking difference between the materials because this is related to how the atoms are interacting to each other. Right? 
So furthermore, if you do second harmonic generation imaging, SG imaging, you will see that uh, you know, the high signal spirals is completely dark, which actually means that this is symmetric. SG need the material to be asymmetric to have signal. The triangular spirals are really bright and the mixed spirals are in between. So this tells you there's some symmetry difference between all of these structures. But again, it took a long time before we understood what and finally, we understood this is actually sort of the the uh, you know uh, the, uh, the 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 explanation uh, you know uh, slide. So the triangular spiral is usually a simple single triangular spiral. In this one, remember, is a single spiral, so it's really one layer. All of them is going one direction because of one layer. And I told you the MS two layers are having an intrinsic symmetry. So I represent that with an arrow here. And, and I can use a plus sign to say it's going one way or the other. So all of them are same direction. So this is actually what you call AA, okay? AA stacking. And now uh, if you have a high signal spiral, turns out what happens through that, uh, the second distribution you actually get, I told you there's two distribution there, are flipped 60 degrees. You flip them and restack them together. In that 60 degrees flipping, the symmetry of that layer flipped. They go from going this way to the other way. So we have a positive and negative. So this is what you call AB. So it's actually 2H, the so-called 2H stacking in the traditional language, right? So now this one have no symmetry because, uh, ha, ha, you know, have, have a central symmetry because now you can relate uh, across a layer to give them that symmetry, right? So now the, the mixed one, the truncated one is somewhere in between. You have two layer, one direction, the other layer, the other direction and you know, it's actually mixed. And so the symmetry is somewhere in between because there's some asymmetry, but overall it's not you know, fairly central symmetric, right? In fact, you have even more complex stackings, you know, AA, you know, B, you know, BB, AA, B, you name it, you know, doesn't matter, right? So here is some polar apps, right? So basically we understood that by having this control on, uh, you know, on, you know, on, on, on dissolution, you can actually have diversity of spirals and actually uh, have diversity of structures. And in some sense, the school diffusion is a fundamental reason to give you these uh, stacking variations. You know, in, from a solid state chemist point of view, I was very happy to think that this might be the kinetic pathway to give you that uh, spiral, right? So we furthermore did additional, uh, uh, you know, more careful work uh, together with Professor Alien Pan from Hunan University, where, uh, we, uh, you know, we were able to uh, control even the number of spirals uh, to some degree, you know, one spiral, two spirals, three spirals, up to five spirals, and they're actually quite fun to play with in, in that regard. Right, okay. So now I will actually also speak a little more because this detail will matter. Uh, we, uh, you know, my group, uh, I actually never thought my group as a 2D materials group, okay? We are growing nanostructures out of 2D materials, right? So, uh, so uh, but this is actually a new thing we did in the last few years where we use uh, water vapor to allow us to tune the synthesis a little bit differently from other people. In fact, again, the idea is to twin super saturation. So water vapor react with the, uh, uh, the, uh, the starting precursor of the, uh, uh, tungsten sulfide in this case to make some hydroxide, which is actually more volatile. And then you transfer later and re-decompose -decom actually to give you uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, the tungsten sulfide back. So, so this is actually what people in the solid state chemistry call chemical vapor transport, is you are really transferring the, you know, the MS2 from one side to the other, right? So with that kind of water vapor control, in, for example, in this case, we're able to get more layers, few layers, and school situations. We're going to grow hydrostructures. So, uh, so, uh, so this uh, is actually the little trick we do that actually is, turns out to be potentially useful and interesting, you know, in, uh, in, a, in, in the thing that I will show next, right? So, uh, so, uh, so uh, in fact, another fascinating video here is actually we did that water delivery by heating up a, a piece of uh, gypsum, calcium sulfate of this water, right? That actually, in fact, help uh, with, the, uh, uh, with actually that control because you don't have to play with liquid water and so on. So, so you can read uh, in that paper if you want to learn more about that detail. Right? So now this now bring to the final part of my work, uh, which is about interlayer twisting of 2D materials. Okay, so this is now I'll come back to twist again. Okay, so it turns out uh, that people are really, really fascinated by twisting in 2D materials. Okay, so, uh, so what I show here, I just played a cartoon where you see, uh, you know, that when you twist two different 2D materials, uh, two materials over each other with a small angle, you create a super lattice called Moe super lattice, okay? And this is really, really exciting because it gives you a new dimension, a new degree of freedom to control the material properties 
uh, you know, excitingly, uh, two years ago, there is a pair of paper in Nature where they show by twisting two layer graphene, it's a very small angle called magic angle. You can create superconductivity out of uh, th these materials. Okay, and uh, and uh, and uh, also people are actually able to uh, to uh, to use this twisting to create uh, you know uh, uh, you know Moe Valley acetones, as shown in uh, some paper later. So uh, so people in the 2D material field are very excited to get additional twisted structures. And the, so far, the twisting people do are just doing mechanical stacking. You got a scotch tape to get one structure, you put another one on top, and you actually very carefully control the orientation to make sure they're twisted at the right degrees, right? So, and, and this is actually how, how some of these papers are done, you know, very amazing, you know, a precise work, you know, a very, uh, you know, a remarkable achievement. But now people are also thinking that you might do 3D twisting structures. Here is a theoretical paper where they call 3D twist phonics. They imagine a continuous stack of uh, twisting layers, you know, continuously going for many layers. And, and that's really interesting. But the question is, how can you make that? Can you make that at all? Right, turns out you could make twist using HB twist. I told you about HB twist. When you have a school dissuasion, you have a gentle twist in the crystal structure, right? In fact, last year, there are two papers in Nature they show that by making small diameter nanowires of a 2D material, germanium sulfide, uh, you actually can observe twists in these layer materials, okay? Uh, which is actually quite beautiful work, you know, very uh, nicely done. But here's a problem, because I told you the HV twist is inversely proportional to pi r square. So the larger the 2D plate, the smaller the twist, okay? So these structures see some very small twists because the diameter is very small. But if you want to work with 2D layers that, that we typically like to work with, which is usually on the range of microns or tens of microns, the twist will be very subtle and very small. And so other than the HP twist, there really has been no theoretical basis to make twist in uh, layer materials. And that's actually the problem, okay? You can always, by, only by luck, when you grow them, there's no way to actually make twist, right? So how do you do that? So that's the question, right? You can, you know, uh, either do it by disassemble the layers and try to stack them layer by layer, you know, uh, which you can do. You know, people are doing that now already. But can you do it differently, right? Of course, you know, if you build a microscopic structure, you can always de decide layer by layer. But now, if you have a ton of layers, who is going to play that hand and twist each layer and give you that precise control, right? So we're going to use something very different. To solve this problem, we're going to use non-Euclidean geometry. Okay, so what do you mean? Uh, Non-Euclidean geometry means these are non-flat surfaces, are curved surfaces. Okay, so uh, this is not something intuitive to us because we think about flat surfaces all the time, right? But you know, non-Euclidean geometry is very important to explain the uh, you know uh, space-time. You know, uh, you know, uh, you have to use uh, this geometry to explain uh, general relativity. And in fact, you know, artists think about new non-Euclidean geometry all the time. You can think about Van Gogh and you know these people particularly love Escher plot. You see uh, all of these beautiful. These are actually due to uh, hyperbolic geometries. So these actually can give you really interesting unusual situations. So here is how we're going to do twisting in two D materials using non-Euclidean surfaces. And uh, the one we use is actually very trivial. Probably the simplest you can ever do is actually by using a cone structure. So now imagine. You have a original regular two, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, triangular plate where everything are aligned. Okay, they are aligned because they are on the flat surface. Okay, and they are aligned because that school dissuasion is a common connector through them, and that is very important because that set orientation. Otherwise, you do not know what is the orientation between the last year and this year. Having that dissuasion lets you remember how your orientation are like. So now. If you put this uh, spiral onto a cone surface, and then you would actually realize actually that you know by forcing this to go on a hyperbolic you know uh, cone surface, you actually have to miss an angle when you actually drip it down. And every time you make a turn, you actually miss a little angle. Every time you have to catch it up by twisting a layer a little bit to uh, to make that thing match. So that means match between the two D Euclidean nature of the material you grow and the non-Euclidean surface dictate, actually, that you need to make a little 
twist angle in this structure to actually make this uh, twist, right? So here is actually a little bit more detail. In fact, you can write uh, the equations out uh, is uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, probably the first month of your analytical geometry class, you can define a transformation from the you know, flat surface to a non-Euclidean surface to derive the equations. But here are the basic illustrations. If you have a flat surface, you can create a, a line spiral. If you have a, uh, uh, a, 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 you know, a little uh, a cone surface, you can actually make that spiral twist one way. If you're gonna have a little uh, dimple in the structure, like a saddle point, you're gonna do another twist uh, called unfastened. You're gonna go the opposite way from the original twist, right? So it's actually called hyperbolic cone, right? In fact, with this kind of understanding, we're able to simulate and you can actually predict that depending on the K vectors, uh, the, the K parameter you define here, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, which is actually defined on top of here, you're going to generate a one degree twist, three degree twist, five degree as you go, right? In fact, you see the range here is very large. You can get very large twist depending on how much you create, right? Uh, and in fact, the structure envelope you make here will be actually, uh, in fact, proven to be Archimedean uh, spiral curves. So we are able to grow that. So that's actually what are shown here. In fact, all of this estimation probably is a lot better to show a little uh, too bad. Actually, the video can now play. So uh, you will have to watch the video when the paper come out. Okay, so uh, uh, you don't have to read the max. You can just build a paper model uh, using scissor and tape and try to play that yourself. And you can see right away this works, right? So uh, unfortunately, uh, the uh, video didn't play, so uh, that's okay. So here are some details of the structure we're going to show. Uh, this is the uh, original uh, flat triangular spiral. If you have a little bit of twist, you see, uh, you know, uh, See between different layers, there's a bit of twist here. And then this one twists a little bit more, uh, F twists even more, right? In fact, another fascinating thing is actually that if you look at the object at the uh, optical level, this uh, looks like a really, really, really uh, messy uh, round objects, okay? Uh, I challenge a lot of you, uh, you might have seen this in your synthesis, okay? So we've come back, we've seen this before already in our synthesis, right? So, so far, when we grow this in our in tungsten sulfide, tungsten sulfide, we also grow moly sulfide, more are coming. And I believe, we believe that the mass principle behind this does not depend on exactly what 2D materials are. It's a general principle, it's based on mass, right? So if you have any growth of 2D materials, I think this could work. And of course, you can actually get even more complex structures based on the shape, based on the size, based on the stacking, and so on and so forth. I won't elaborate and go into that detail. Right, so, uh, so now also I'll show you some more details here. This is actually a more detailed analysis of the spirals here. In fact, you can trace out all of the edges here and actually uh, calculate what is the twist angle based on that geometry. In fact, uh, the, uh, the, in this structure, the twist per layer is actually 15 degrees. So it's actually a very dramatic twist. And uh, we actually uh, follow the three arms, the uh, three edges. Actually, they follow the same curve. Actually, the, the simulated structure based on 50 degree and the, uh, uh, the shape from the AFM match really, really well. And also I want to point out to you that I didn't show a lot of detail about how uh, this uh, Euclidean geometry can be enabled. Uh, you have to wait to read our papers. It's actually quite trivial, but you, I will point out to you to see the center of this uh, spiral have a bit of protrusion. You see the things are wrinkled around it because of the uh, distortion due to that protrusion, right? Uh, we also further did uh, STM analysis, uh, you know, a very elaborate uh, electron diffraction and imaging analysis by Professor Paul Weiss and his uh, uh, student at that time, Zhen Yu. And, and this actually show that uh, just uh, like the uh, imaging analysis, you see a very nice angle dependence and then you see the MOE pattern. So uh, the D, E, F are actually the uh, MOE pattern you observed due to the uh, simple twisting spiral here. And then uh, the, uh, the bottom ones are the simulated patterns, actually the diffraction curves are here. You can see the different arms that are coming out in this way, right? Okay, so I think my time is up. Uh, so, uh, so this is the last thing I show. So uh, we make 2D material twist, right? So to just quickly summarize, uh, I show you a few things about controlling 1D and 2D material growth by rational control using dissolution. And these are actually explaining a lot of different morphology in a uniform way, and actually is general phenomenon. And I also show you how you can get twist in structures by HP twist by modulating your dissolution. And furthermore, the last segment, I show you a new idea beyond dissolution, where we are going beyond the Euclidean geometry to use non-Euclidean geometry to understand and predict and uh, potentially rationally control the systematic twisting of MS spirals in the future beyond the HP twist. Right, so I think the general message I want to give is actually that the properties and function of monomaterials are controlled and determined 
by the nanostructures at the atomic level. In the 2D materials case, the stacking, the phase, the twisting of them can be all controlled if we know how. We have to be creative about it. And if we can control them, no whole quantum phenomenon and enhanced property can come from this understanding. And that's why we're here. That's why we're actually excited about this. And uh, in this game, I think creativity and imagination is the only limit. You know, uh, we work on this for 12 years and we could never imagine actually what we found out last year about this Euclidean dream geometry. And we're so excited and there are many more things to do along this line, right? So again, go back to the message I get at the beginning. Uh, I will just add a little parenthesis. Even after a few decades, I think there is still plenty of room at the bottom. And uh, nanoscientists and nanotechnologies have many years of important work to do ahead of us, right? So I like to thank my students. Uh, this is actually the more recent group, uh, you know, uh, stay at home uh, Zoom pictures. And uh, the student at bottom here, Yu Zhou, is the, uh, you know, uh, the genius who actually came up with the Euclidean geometry. So, uh, you know, it's very, uh, very exciting. Actually, we're really excited about that. So I show a really old vintage photo from my group that shows some of our early students. Matt Bierman discovered a tree, uh, sea marine understood the tubes. So there are other students in between I could not find all of them. This is like, as I said, right? A project that spanned over uh, now uh, 13, 14 years already, right? So, uh, so uh, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And, uh, you know, uh, I'd like to happy to answer any question you might have. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, thanks, Professor Chin, for the fantastic talk. So I, I can't wait him for for the paper come out about the two and two D materials. It's not like uh, science, like art. Okay, uh, so uh, it's time to look at the questions from the audience. Yeah, should I uh, share the screen so I can see the question? I think Alice will uh, share the screen with us. So I need to unshare, right? Uh, yeah. uh, yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, question one. For the CNT tree, it looks very cool. How about the strength and the mechanical property? And oh. uh, how about the connection of the CNT? Uh, yes. Actually, uh, first of all, uh, I apologize. I didn't say it very clearly. Uh, that tree was made out of uh, lead sulfide. Uh, it's a rock salt structure. It's not, uh, it's not uh, you know, uh, uh, it's not uh, a nanotube. And, uh, but uh, the question uh, still stands, right? So the mechanical properties of these materials are really gonna be quite fascinating. I was always intrigued by that, but I never have that skill set myself. So one question you can ask is actually that if you put a tree in the microscope and you use some manipulator to untwist that tree, can you destroy that dislocation, right? Uh, so you can use that as a little playground to do nanomechanics. And uh, I do not have that skill set. And I uh, will talk to someone who potentially could be doing this uh, many years ago when this paper just came out, but nothing came out of it. I think this is still a interesting topic to work on, right? There's a whole uh, school of people who are doing nanomechanics. In fact, they use, usually often use uh, whiskers and stuff like that to do this. So I think it's still a uh, fascinating thing to work on, yeah. Okay, uh, great. Uh, let's uh, take a look at question two. Uh, dislocation bring about so many amazing structures. Is there any strategy to Finally, introduce and control this location in a well designed way. It's actually what I'm keen. Ah, yes. Uh, uh, so, as I said in the boss joke, that dissolution is uh, uh, everywhere, right? So, in some sense, we got lucky. We didn't have to work for it, uh, unlike in the VLS, where you have to find the nanoparticle and create them and put them in there. Uh, but at the same time, that's now very well controlled, right? Uh, so I think the way to do that is to utilize something that was already controlled dissolution. We had done one work that I took out in the interest of time here, where we took uh, gallium nitride uh, uh, wafers. And as I alluded to, gallium nitrides are prone to have dislocations. Uh, so we basically went to our colleague, uh, Professor Tom Keach in Cam E here, who actually grow gallium nitride by MOCBD. So we basically uh, raided his garbage bin, the chips that he hates, that he didn't grow very well, we took them. And then we cleaned the surface, we exposed the dissolution on it. And then we're able to grow nanowires vertically out of those dissolution uh, that was exposed. So it was a paper published in NanoEdder. In fact, I showed that citation that the paper in 2010 uh, that we did a twist contour analysis, but I didn't show the growth result. Right. So that was the one attempt we made in controlling uh, the source of dissolution, but I'm sure 
There are many other things you can do that we haven't gone uh, a lot to do, right? Although, uh, as I also alluded to, uh, that uh, if you are able to control this situation, I think there are a lot you can do, but, uh, you know, including maybe use that to manipulate uh, nanocube growth. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what I said. I threw that challenge to my students and no one have, um, you know, uh, stood up to, took it, uh, to take it yet. Uh, but that is a hard problem because at some point, you have to say, where is that, uh, you know, a singularity come from? Where is that break come from? How do you control that clarity? Uh, it is a, uh, a issue that you cannot fully, you know, solve, right? There is a region, uh, you know, the chicken and egg problem. At some point, uh, the clarity have to come from somewhere. Uh, so so that's, uh, that's the question that still bothers us and we're working on with some other ideas, you know, using very different concepts. Yeah. Okay, uh, question Xue. For all these two structures from the nature and your research, fundamentally, are uh, they follow the lowest energy rule? Uh, I think from a philosophical point of view, I would say I agree. <laughs> and I'm a believer in uh, uh, you know, the, the idea that everything has a reason. And this is why I go into garden, uh, gardens. And that, that picture I showed the tendril, I took it from my garden. I was like, why did it grow this way? It has a reason. And maybe that reason is connected to what I'm doing. Right, I don't know, right? But I like to find out what is that reason, right? So I do believe there's a reason, and usually the easiest reason is a thermodynamic reason, uh, because you go this way, uh, it is actually lower in energy. So nature would like to go that way because it lowers energy, right? So, uh, so that uh, philosophically, in a very broad uh, manner, uh, I think I will agree with that uh, general assessment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question: What's the most exciting physical phenomenon or the property you think in more superlatives that make this material different from others. Yeah, so I think uh, this is, uh, I'm a bit uh, disqualified to uh, uh, answer these questions, I would say, because I, right now, I'm not fully engaged in studying these physical properties, so I don't think about them uh, every day, right? But I read papers just like you are, you know, and I think, you know, all of this uh, manipulating the uh, correlation between uh, the different materials and getting this uh, very sophisticated control on the, uh, you know, uh, the energy landscape and the quantum matters are really why this is so unique and interesting, right? But I don't think uh, I'm, uh, uh, you know, uh, very qualified to, uh, to, to, to uh, dare to uh, make predictions. I think uh, people like Philip Kim, who actually uh, spoke here, uh, I think a few weeks ago, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the people who published some of this paper, you know, Professor uh, Zhu, Professor uh, Xu, uh, you know, and uh, the, the professor from MIT, uh, uh, they probably have much more insight than I do on this. But I think what I offer today is to say to them, look, now you have a new toolbox in your hand. If you want to have 3D twisting structures, you uh, might not have to uh, do the uh, layer by layer stacking anymore. Uh, you might actually be able to uh, get our structures and actually go straight to uh, do your studies in a much more productive way. Right? So uh, I'm much more on the synthetic side of this game at this moment. Yeah, but I like to learn more about it. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think this is our last question. Can you give comments with the twist with the origami or origami? Ah, okay. So that's what I love about the question and answers. So, uh, uh, so uh, whoever writes this uh, question, please feel free to send me an email. We can discuss more, right? <laughs> but uh, I will say uh, I skipped that paper because it, it was a little bit off the track. We had even a paper on uh, origami of MS2 materials, which is very odd. And, and uh, it was published in JAX, uh, I think four years ago, uh, no, actually two years ago, something like that. And so uh, what we learned there is actually that to get kirigami, the, to me, the one bare essence of kirigami is cutting, right? Uh, you have to cut. So uh, what we realized in that is we learn how to etch. And, and we realized actually that etching depends on the stacking. Okay, so, uh, so we create very complex kirigami structures. Uh, I think it is a good question, a legitimate question, that if we now take these twisting structures and etch them, what kind of more unique and complex structure we'll get, right? So that's actually, uh, in fact, uh, something, honestly, I just uh, think about it now and I think it makes sense, right? So I guess the question is who will get to do it, right? And how quickly we'll find something interesting and we can understand, right? Origami is a whole different matter. Origami is far more complex, okay? And I've been reading paper about origamis, but I don't know where to start uh, because just like in this case, how would you imagine you go in and use your hand to, uh, you know, uh, fold each of the uh, structure you grow, right? So I don't know, right? So, uh, but maybe the concept of origami can be applied and uh, played in a different manner that I haven't thought about. 
Um, but uh, but I think thank you for that good question. I think these are why we're here, right? So keep thinking about it. Don't be afraid, right? So as I said in the panel discussion, don't be afraid to ask that question. And uh, it might not work now. And I, I don't know what do I do with that, you know, a question now. But uh, maybe in two day, two years, uh, something will come to me, and uh, something else interesting will happen, right? Thank you. Okay, okay. Thanks, uh, Professor Jin. The great talk. So I do enjoy it. So maybe uh, let invite Alice to have something some words with us. Okay, great. Thank you, Zhang, and thank you, Jin. Yeah, so really nice talk. Yeah, we enjoy a lot. So you deliver so many beautiful things. Yeah, not only your structures, also the ideas how to make this kind of nature different, you know, structures and make something fun and make something useful. So uh, I like the title is to trace or not to trace. Yeah, it's really, really beautiful uh, lectures and uh, we enjoy a lot. We appreciate your hard work. And this was I can act deliver to you. So the certification for you are I can X tax. Your technology was connect the world and the universe. So thank you Jim very much. And uh, this was the end of today. So next week is our national holiday, but we continue for ICAC talks on uh, October 2nd. So we will have uh, Julia and uh, Carl on the stage. So uh, Paul will be, uh, be, the chief, uh, be the chair for this session. So they will deliver wonderful talks about on the surface, how to manage and all these surveys, how to you know do some magic things on the surface. So next week the topic is play magic on the material surface. Please stay with us on I can X. And this was a bunch of papers or someone already delivered talk and someone was coming soon. So uh, stay with us every Friday and you can follow us on Twitter, YouTube and I can innovation quality. So this is all for you and uh, all these tasks, all these uh, top scientists all came to this stage is uh, yeah for you, you know, to learn something new, uh, for you to so know something was happening right now. And this was uh, the conference I'm uh, organizing now. So yeah, the abstract deadline is October 20. Be sure, you know, to submit your latest work to this MAMS 2021. We're all online. Uh, we're looking forward to see you. Uh, yeah, this is the end of today. We appreciate all of you uh, help and all of your work. So enjoy. I can ask the talks next Friday. We we'll see you the same time. Okay, bye bye. Have a good weekend. Bye. Hi. Uh, so yeah, very very nice talk. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, are you still here? Yeah, yeah. wait, yeah. wait, wait. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Turn no. on the mic.